In the early 1940s, the residents of Port Orford, Oregon, along the state's southern coast, were still hurting from the impact of the Great Depression. They desperately wanted to make a living off their city's abundant natural resources, like timber and copper, but the roads they needed to bring their goods to market were either inadequate or non-existent, and they felt their concerns were being dismissed or neglected by state lawmakers who hailed predominantly from the larger, better paved cities in the north. So the mayor of Port Orford, Gilbert Gable, decided to take matters into his own hands. In a public speech in October 1941, he suggested that if lawmakers would not heed the concerns of Southern Oregonians, they ought to form a new state altogether, joining with the people of Northern California who were enduring the same frustrations with their public leaders at the same time. Gilbert Gable, who had previously worked in public relations, may have hatched the plan as a publicity stunt to bring attention to the issue of unbuilt roads. But residents on both sides of the border began to take the idea of secession seriously. After receiving the endorsement of the Wairika California Chamber of Commerce, the Board of Supervisors in Siskiyou County, California allocated funds to explore the possibility of separating from the rest of the state. Meanwhile, the Siskiyou Daily News held a public naming contest to christen their new state and settled on the name Jefferson. Jefferson residents even developed a state flag and state seal, which included a gold pan with two X's in the middle symbolizing the double cross that residents felt from leaders in Salem and Sacramento. On November 27th, four counties, including Curry County, Oregon, and Del Norte, Siskiyou, and Trinity County, California, officially declared their independence, and the self-appointed border control of the new state of Jefferson began halting drivers on Highway 99 to hand out copies of their proclamation of independence. On December 4th, following the unexpected death of Jefferson's governor, Gilbert Gables, Several prominent media members were in attendance to watch the inauguration of the state's new governor, John Childs. Newsreels from the celebration in Wairika, California were scheduled to be released in theaters the following Monday, December 8th. Jefferson residents felt uplifted by the recognition and encouraged that this high-profile coverage would lend national legitimacy to their drive for statehood. But to their misfortune and to the shock and sadness of the entire United States, their quixotic campaign was abruptly curtailed by a more serious turn of events. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Welcome to the Political Podcast, Policy in a Golden State of Mind. My name is Tony Mastria, and thank you for joining me on this two-part episode of our show. As I mentioned last week, we just passed a very special anniversary in California's history, celebrating its 165th year as a state. California was admitted to the Union on September 9, 1850, so between this week and next, we'll be talking all about statehood, including how California became a state, and more interestingly, how people have tried to break it up into more states since then. Depending on where you look, there have been anywhere between two dozen and 200 attempts to split California over the last century and a half. And in honor of this revered tradition in our state, I decided to split this episode into two parts as well. Also, this subject is just overflowing with colorful characters and kooky ideas, and frankly, I wasn't prepared to cut any of them out of the story. They all deserve their chance in the spotlight. So instead of sending you one extra long podcast all at once, I'm going to give you two smaller, more manageable podcasts spread out over the week. Hopefully that helps the crazy go down a little easier. Anyway, 165 years as a state may not sound like much, especially compared to the likes of Delaware, Georgia, and Maryland, who have an extra half century of statehood under their belts. But given the number of separation attempts, it's somewhere between a marvel and a fluke that California has lasted even this long as a single state. The Wairika Rebellion, described at the top of the show, is just one example of the many concerted efforts to divide California. And the story of the state of Jefferson isn't even the closest we've come to actually breaking up, though it is truly one of the most colorful. <laughs> 
Over the course of this two-part podcast, we'll cover some of the more serious attempts to crack the Golden State, including a campaign that happened just last year, which would have divided California into not two, not three, but six different states. And as I mentioned, we'll also be looking at some of the wackier efforts at separation, including one that involved converting a cargo ship from World War II into an artificial island off the California coast to create an independent nation and tax-free fish factory. You can't make this stuff up. But we'll begin by observing that California's separation anxiety began even before it achieved statehood, which, at this point, you probably aren't surprised to hear. So let's run through a brief history of how California became a state in the first place. While the native population had inhabited California for thousands of years, the first European settlers didn't arrive until 1542. That's the year that Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo sailed up the California coast and claimed the area for the Empire of Spain. Over the next few centuries, each of the major world powers made claims to various parts of the state, including France, Russia, and England, led by the explorer Sir Francis Drake. But for the most part, the region was dominated by the Spanish and retained the character of its original colonists. By the time the United States had formed in the late 1700s, California was fully under Spain's control. That is, until 1821 when it became part of Mexico following the Mexican War of Independence. And finally, in the 1840s, California began to come under American control at the end of the Mexican-American War. In January 1847, American Colonel John C. Fremont and Mexican Captain Andres Pico signed the Treaty of Coenga, which ended military operations in modern-day California and throughout most of the American Southwest. This agreement would serve as a precursor to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which formally ended the war in 1848 and transferred ownership of California to the U.S. Given its defeat, Mexico didn't have much say in the matter, but the choice to relinquish California would have been extra painful had they known what was discovered there just a week before they gave it up. On January 24, 1848, gold was unearthed at a sawmill in Coloma, California, near present-day Sacramento. This discovery, which occurred in a place that would soon be known as the County of El Dorado, appropriately enough, ignited the gold rush and spurred California's drive for statehood. When California was first incorporated as an American territory in 1848, its population was comprised of just a few thousand people, primarily of Spanish and Mexican descent. These people, known as the Californios, mostly resided in Southern California, where they lived in sparsely populated communities and subsisted predominantly on agriculture. But by the end of 1849, California's population had ballooned to about 100,000 people, fueled by the newcomers hoping to strike it rich in California's northern mining towns. At the time, California was still emerging from the effects of the Mexican-American War, but the territory's recent migrants, who came primarily from American cities in the east, weren't fond of the system of military rule in place at the time so they called a constitutional convention for the goal of creating a civilian government instead. In September and October of 1849, delegates convened in the city of Monterey to develop a state constitution, as well as a precise map of the territory their new state would occupy. The plan was passed by the convention on October 13th and sent to Congress and the President for federal approval. After a few failed attempts to pass the plan in Congress, including an initial push by Senator Henry Clay of Kentucky, California's admission to the Union was finally approved as part of the Compromise of 1850. The plan, which actually consisted of five separate bills, was brokered by Senator Stephen Douglas of Illinois and sought to diffuse regional tensions around the question of slavery in the new territories. After passing both the House and Senate, the plan was signed into law by President Millard Fillmore on September 9, 1850, and with that, California became the 31st state in the Union. In any other case on statehood in America, this might be the end of our story, but in California it's only the beginning. And if our experience of the last 165 years is any indication, California becoming a state may actually be the least interesting part of our history on this issue. Right from the beginning, a huge portion of California's newly minted population felt buyer's remorse over the state they'd just created. The center of discontent rested in the southern half of the state, with the small community of Californios who'd been rapidly overtaken by newcomers in the north. 
As early as 1849, when California held its first constitutional convention, the small number of Californios in attendance expressed grave apprehension over the idea of a united California. Their concerns were sincere and legitimate, revolving around the fundamental issues of taxation and representation. They worried that because they subsisted on agriculture and owned large tracts of land for that purpose, they would be forced to contribute substantially more in property taxes than those in the North, who generally worked in mining and leased the parcels of land where they lived and worked. As a result, they agonized over the possibility that they might be impoverished simply from making a living. Californians were also concerned that despite their long-standing residence in the region, they would be politically overpowered by the more populous northerners who had arrived in just the past few years. And they were less than thrilled that the new halls of government, including the Capitol and Supreme Court, would be situated so far away in the northern half of the state, where they were at best inconvenient and at worst inaccessible. So when it came to representation, residents in Southern California faced not only the figurative barrier imposed by simple arithmetic, but also the literal barrier erected by the state's massive size and often hostile geography. They voiced these concerns at the Constitutional Convention of 1849, and even pressed for the creation of two separate governments, one that would become a state government in the North, and another that would remain a federal territory in the South. Although their skepticism never fully dissipated, Southern Californians were eventually persuaded to adopt a single state government after Northerners agreed to include some protective provisions on land assessment. This is the plan that would eventually make it to the president's desk and form the modern state of California. But as residents would soon realize, this attempt at reconciliation would instead spark a decade of contention. One by one, Southern Californians' worst fears came true and they ended up providing the lion's share to support a government that offered them few services and little representation. In fiscal year 1851, it's estimated that they contributed twice as much in property tax revenue as Northern Californians, despite being 20 times smaller in population. By another measure, the total tax burden per person, which includes all state taxes at the time, was over 150% larger in agricultural counties as it was in mining counties. In other words, Northerners paid substantially less to the state even though they had 20 times more people and immeasurably greater access to government. This combination of downsized influence and outsized taxes created a toxic sense of mistrust in the southern half of the state a sentiment that was only compounded by the belief that their concerns were being dismissed or ignored upstate. After emerging from a decade of civil war in the region, residents felt at best like neglected stepchildren and at worst like a conquered people. They believed the present system of government was patently unfair, and, convinced that this wasn't what they signed up for, they agitated for a change. Throughout the decade, members of the state's southern delegation put forth different proposals to divide up the state, one of the more interesting of which came from Assemblyman Jefferson Hunt of San Bernardino. Hunt's bill called for the state to be split in two, but the committee that reviewed his proposal changed that number to three, California in the middle, Shasta in the north, and Colorado in the south. As an aside, it's worth pointing out here that the name Colorado, which comes up a few times in our story, came from the river that runs along the state's eastern edge, and the state we now call Colorado would not be established for another few decades. In any case, what made this proposal interesting is not only that it would have divided California into three separate pieces, which was a new idea at the time, but also that it would have swallowed up about a third of modern-day Nevada, including Reno, but sadly not Las Vegas. The legislature adjourned before it could put Hunt's bill to a vote, and as lawmakers turned their attention to other pressing matters, the idea of separation was placed on the back burner. And that brings our story to 1859, the closest California has ever come to breaking up. A bill to split Northern and Southern California was introduced by Assemblyman Andres Pico, the same Andres Pico who signed the Treaty of Coenga 12 years earlier and helped to end the Mexican-American War. The legitimacy of Pico's proposal was due in large part to his credibility on both sides of the issue. 
Pico was a Southern Californian who had previously served on the California side of the Mexican-American War. But he'd also been gracious in defeat and readily embraced the American system of government, even serving as a California state legislator several times throughout the 1850s. Pico's proposal would have divided the state along the Tehachapi Mountains to form a new federal territory called Colorado, encompassing the southern counties of Los Angeles, San Diego, Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo, and San Bernardino. By this time, the North had come to accept that there were serious and possibly irreparable problems in their union with the South, and saw Pico's proposal as a potentially amicable solution to these areas of discord. Interestingly, Shortly after Pico unveiled his idea, eight counties in California's far north, including Del Norte, Trinity, and Siskiyou, proclaimed that they too were prepared to form their own state. In truth, these counties probably had little interest in seceding, and their gambit was instead an attempt to blunt Pico's proposal, if not a parody of the secession movement as a whole. But the sideshow provides an intriguing bit of foreshadowing for what would occur almost identically eight decades later. Whatever this proto-Jefferson sideshow revealed about California at the time, Pico's proposal was ultimately passed by the Assembly and Senate and, when put to a vote of the people, received 75% support from residents in the affected counties. Finally, Governor John Weller signed the bill and sent it to Washington for approval. And for the first and only time in history, the state of California bid itself goodbye. There was just one problem. All of this happened on the eve of the 1860s, and as compelling as California's problems seemed locally at the time, they paled in comparison to the tensions brewing in the country's east. Pico's proposal was received by a federal government bracing for civil war and was quickly relegated to the bottom of the nation's priorities. As this incident showed, and as the citizens of the state of Jefferson would find out 80 years later, the only thing that's kept California together for so long seems to be poor timing. That's our show. Thank you for joining me on part one of our two-part statehood celebration you can find all the source material from this episode and more by visiting our website, politicalpod.blogspot.com. And if you're new to the show, you can subscribe and receive part two as soon as it's out next week by visiting our profiles on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Stitcher. Last but not least, you can connect with the show on social media by going to facebook.com slash politicalpod and following us on Twitter at politicalpod. Please send your comments, questions, suggestions, and corrections however you choose to reach out to the show. Since today we covered a lot of the early history of statehood in California, next week we're going to talk about more modern attempts to break up the state, including a few symbolic movements that occurred in the 20th century and a few serious ones that took place in just the past few years. And if you're waiting for the craziest elements of this topic, I promise that the stories we encounter next week will be truly bizarre. Here's a preview. What do a Hollywood actor, a professional diver, and the son of a Mexican president have in common? A concrete ship, a quarry full of boulders, and a shared dream of tax-free seafood. What does any of this mean? Tune in to find out. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next week.